Hello everyone and welcome back to Neopets The Darkest Fairy. Last time we landed in Altador. Now we have our goal. Awakening four of the twelve legendary heroes in order to free the districts of the Darkest Fairy's influence that has been around for, well, last thousand years, I guess? It's kind of weird that one district is attached to each, there's four heroes, pretty much, because when you have a team of 12, 11 not counting the Darkest Fairy, it makes it feel like there is this tiered list where one hero is more important than another. And you'll see that as we're going through the districts. But where should we start? Well, technically, you can do this in any order, but in terms of trying to match the cutscenes, which is not going to be as successful as I want it to be, but that's because of the game. We're going to start in the Bazaar District. Now, in terms of exploring the districts as they are around in the purple fog, the purple clouds, there isn't much that we can actually do. None of the people are out, all of the shops and doors are locked, and there's minions just kind of floating around. So. Pretty much that means for all of the districts is you're trying to make a beeline for the shrine in order to get it liberated as soon as possible. And for the Bazaar District, it has Kellen the Quick as its main hero. In order to find his shrine, we have the first hint, which was back at his statue in the Hall of Heroes, which was under their city, you make your home a dry fountain as your doorstep. That's your first clip. The second clue is, well, the fact that the funnel for the dark clouds just kind of ends here, of all places, looks really bad, to, to be honest. But you know, if you look up every now and once and again, you will be able to find out that, hey, this very specific place is more unique than the rest of the district. But what are we to do here? Well, we have three statues around. It looks like they are able to be turned. They can. Just a simple button press. Or a couple button presses. And we just have to make sure that they're pointing in the direction of the... Well, the technically dry fountain. I guess with all the sludge in it. That is not drinkable water. Hopefully it'll be a better color once we have this liberated. Yes. Open the door up, and we enter into our first shrine. Each shrine is its own dungeon, technically. The sewer shrine is the longest of the four, so it's good that we're getting it out of the way first. There's also a lot to the sewer shrine that really doesn't work, and it kind of shows that the development team were trying to implement a whole bunch of things at once into this game, and I really wish that they were not as ambitious as they really thought they wanted to be. The first section of the shr sewer shrine is dealing with pitfalls. Three pads that you have to get across in a certain way in order to get to the other side of the room. This is the most... well... Not most least interesting part of this dungeon because, well, it's kind of busy work. The sewer shrine is not great for visual appeal because it's mostly, well, I guess storage rooms mostly is what they use for how everything looks. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is just get to one specific area in this underground section and then back up to the main corridor in order to continue forward. Yeah. Break the barrel for me, please. Thank you. Also really shows with these specific buttons that the development team didn't really make a overall consensus of what kind of buttons they wanted to use. Small, big, pressure plates, what? I'm not sure. Oh, come on, man. Here we go. Uh, even you're stuttering. 
Jeez. The minions are really not much to write home about, especially now that we're just kind of going through our Nova modes. Because we have too many. Makes combat very, very easy, and there's not a lot to talk about with this. So once you find the right path, you'll get to a lever, which for some reason turns on the torches and lights up the path that we need. So we head back out, and now, because the path is lit, we're able to get across. Now, there is a question that was on my mind when going through the section again, and that is, what if you knew the path for the next section going forward? Would you be able to get across even though the path was not lit? Here's a video reference of what it looks like for the second part. And um, the answer is no. At least for my experience. I've never been able to travel further than that with any of my uh, playthroughs. But there's some guides out there that will just put down the directions in order to get across. So maybe you're able to get across? Maybe it's my copy of the game? Who knows? Try it yourself, I guess, if you're at this point. But otherwise I would just say no, because they really want to make sure that you go through the design of these sections of the first section of this dungeon. Because otherwise I would just skip it, to be completely honest. But there is enough here that I have to really show it off, otherwise you might get lost. For instance, this section section, in order to get across here, there are vines on the ceiling that you need in order to get across. So there is a level of observation that you need to pay consideration to. There are also two chests that we also need to get as well, so... There's those two. One will be coming up fairly soon. Pretty sure after this room. I also find a lot of the time with Act 4 that Tor is really not the one that's best suited for combat in a lot of environments. It's almost like they really favored Roberta at this point. So we got two doors. One will lead us to the torches that we need. As well as more boxes to just jump on. There we go, there's our switch. Now we can go to our other door and see where it, le it leads. If I can... Nah. Come on. Come on, please. Thank you. There's our chest. Chest number one. Good. Now we can do the long route in order to get back to the main corridor, because there's only one way out. I think the main thing I don't really like about this, and there is a trend with a couple of these dungeons in Act 4 is that there's a lot of just extra busy work in order to get across. And you really should make sure that you're going on this route and this route only because if you stray, if you want to go there really, really fast, it will fall because only the path that's illuminated will make that platform stay up. So be careful. Let's not add any more time to this section of the dungeon that we actually need to do. This third section is just about finding the way forward, because there's plenty of doors, but most of them lead to dead ends. Not just dead ends, but uh, traps as well, because either there's a monster inside, a minion inside, or uh, there was a minion inside and then it decided to despawn itself. There he is. There he goes. <laughs> okay. Got lucky in my swings. 
Everything's good. Uh, hello. He's hiding in the walls. Every time I go, I have to just like result in relying in my residual swing. Like the after swing in order to actually hit anything in some cases. Sometimes I get lucky and it's all convenient. Now there is a center area. If we decide to peer down into there, we see that there is a ledge down there. It doesn't work as an elevator, you just have to drop down. This leads us to the second treasure chest. More power! There's also so many like little barrels and vases and little boxes around that, you know, if you know anything about me, I love just really just wasting time and just like shutting my brain off and trying to play a game like this, that I would just go and smash every box that I could. And I've done this in this game before, I swear to you, I have. I'm going like, I know I shouldn't because there's really no point. Not a lot of extra rewards. And I don't want to outstay my welcome in this place. Especially now that we're getting into the second area. This one is, uh, pretty notorious. I remember some very long, frustrating times with this place. Especially my first go-around. And you'll see why. There's a lot of save points in this area, too. I think three. section off into four sections and you'll see what we have to do. This first area is really just a demonstration of what they're trying to accomplish with this place overall. We have a giant button. Pressing that button makes the eyeball shut. And now we have a button in the center to press. Now you might not have noticed there but there was a minion that just kind of appeared and he's gonna be circling around. Our goal, press that switch, it lowers the drawbridge, and all we need to do is just get to the drawbridge. That minion there, if he were to see you, spot you, and hit you, would make the eyeball open up, and the bridge would then raise as a result. The point I'm trying to get here is, is that this section of the sewer shrine has to do with stealth. We are dealing with Kellen the Quick here, which is the thief of the legendary heroes. And oh my god, they try to implement stealth into the game like this. It's not a good look for this game, I will tell you that much. They really just tried to implement two things. One, planned routes for the minions to kind of go and walk around in, and two, line of sight. And I'll just say that uh, there's a real big chance that depending on whether or not the game likes you at that time of day, it either will work or uh, will be horribly broken and you get to sit around and suffer while the game figures out what it wants to do. Because what the reset button also does is resets the minions and where they are and where they decide to be. And uh, there's a good example of the, the final section of this place that really gets into how well the reset button actually works. And I guess I could say that it's just temperamental. They love just appearing and reappearing and showing up when they 
really shouldn't, and you really don't know what their starting positions are, or where their ending positions are. And my best advice is really just to take it slow, and stick to hugging walls and other areas, just and just kind of get a sense of where they are. And having the Cloak of Heroes equipped is definitely helpful. I don't really know how much more helpful it is versus regular armor, but apparently there's just some invisible effect to it in order to make sure that enemies have less of a chance of seeing you. So, here's the final section. What this section doesn't tell you right away is that you're dealing with two drawbridges. So there's two buttons you have to hit, and you have to hit them successfully without being seen by any minions. If they see you at any point, well, yeah, the eyeball, eyeball goes up, and then they will just hunt you, hunt you constantly. They will hunt you constantly that they won't be affected by this reset button. Still have another one just coming to get me. The other thing you might notice is that, um, well, I've hit the reset button twice now. So, in my head, I'm going, okay, everything should be reset. I should be able to just do what I need to do. Uh, nope, not quite. That eyeball is still up. And then, oh, surprise! <laughs> A minion decided to show up and started to spin in pirouette, going like, yes, I caught you, ha ha ha. Such an annoying thing. He's also unnamed, so this is where they kind of ended up after all this time. That one guy in the Meridal Plains is just kind of all alone in the future. The only real thing I can say in order to make sure that everything works properly is just hit that reset button just multiple times. At least a minimum of four times, just to make sure that the eyeball is shut once again and all the minions are reset as much as they can be, even if they might be patrolling when you hit the reset button constantly. Because again, they tried to make this work, but they certainly didn't do enough testing to make sure that it was solid. I'm really tepid to whether or not I would say this is passable or not. Because, yeah, it does work. But to me, it's never felt right. But I know, I get where they're coming from with it. It's it's theming to connect to the hero that we're dealing with in this specific district. It's just a pain in the butt. Because this section, I know in a past playthrough, like years ago, this whole, that whole last section, just that one, took me maybe about 45 minutes because of how unfair that can really get. And I really wish I could show you something to that degree. I just can't. However, now we have one last section to go through. There's our statue and there's our goal. However, another big giant eyeball that we have to deal with. Which is connected to uh, something really slowly closing on us. And so we have to do some challenges. Some as Tor, some as Roberta. They've split up. We have a countdown for how long it takes in order to for that uh, closing crusher to get to the bottom. The problem is, is that with this first section alone, you get a sense of how much this section has failed when it comes to design overall. You're given 50 seconds at the very start, but that is not enough time to deal with the run around like rigmarole kind of route you have to do with this section of tour alone. Pushing boxes and realizing what you have to do with specific boxes, like this one, you have to push in a specific direction in order to make sure that you're get able to get up on that ledge. So, what happens when time runs out? Nothing really. The trap pretty much just resets itself. It's also a really bad trap because it doesn't look all that big. 
and it only really deals with anything that's right underneath it, and even if it was stuck on that bottom of the door overall, you could probably just climb over it if you were just, like, literally actually there. The other thing that happens is that the, the route doesn't reset itself, so anything that you do in a previous run just stays the way it is, which makes the next attempt a whole lot easier. Overall, with all of this in just this one section alone, it really shows that there are no stakes to this last section. Which, I get it, they kind of want to make this more for kids, but jeez. Like, way to take away any sort of difficulty that you were trying to put into this section like this. It's not the only difficult section either. We're gonna come up to, I think it's technically actually the last section of this that's also really annoying. That has to do with these bounce pads. Because these bounce pads, I haven't really talked about them and they're not in the game a whole lot, but they just kind of shower them in this section alone. I have a feeling now if you try to justify doing this section, because what they tried to do is just kind of mix the two together, um, kind of split them off in order to make sure that it's like in order for both of them to get across. And yeah, falling into the chasm also serves as no penalty whatsoever. But if you were to justify going like, yeah, we're going to make a, an elaborate series of obstacles and challenges for both of the characters to do in order to get across this chasm. It would be a hard sell in order to do this, especially when it comes to the fact that there are no stakes whatsoever. And the only way in, I could think of that this game could do and probably did do early in development is put in a game over scenario so that you would have to do the entire section completely over from the very beginning. And there's such a huge difference between no stakes and game over stakes that really this was the best decision I guess they could have done, really. So here's this last section for you. This section here with the bounce pads really shows the the problems there are with the bounce pads. And also with uh, figuring out where to go next, because you're really just trying to get across that high wall over there. So you think, okay, I'm gonna jump up onto these bounce pads in order to bounce over to the type rope in order to do that. No, you have to go all the way up here and do some extra stuff, but of course you're not given enough time. So, now you have to do it a couple more times in order to train yourself. Bounce pads also don't give you enough jump every now and again in order to get up to that ledge, so that's just more wasted time for you. And the final thing is that jumping across these uh, ropes here, if you don't let go early, you're just going to be catapulted off into the abyss like this. I'm going to slow it down. Pew! So there's so many things that can just go wrong in this one section on top of the tight time uh, restriction. It's baffling. This entire section is baffling on a design level. That I, uh, my goodness, <laughs> I can't believe it sometimes. Luckily, that's all we need to do. There's just two per character in order to do four challenges in total, and then you're reunited again at the other side of the chasm. You're also given a save point, and I don't know why, because all you're doing is just entering into the chamber here and activating the cutscene. Much better. 
I thought you'd be able to do it. If you'd followed a different path in life, you both would have made passable thieves. Do I know you? Ah, the boy is sharp. There's hope for you yet. Here's a token of my good favor. Keep it with you and use it to call me when the time is right. You're bright enough to know when that is. That token that Kellen had in his hand? Yeah, it's a cutscene only kind of item. Much like the amulets were. Unfortunately, yeah, we can't see anything like that. And in order to get out of here, they just sh shine a beam of light off of the altar. And that's our way out. I guess it kind of works. So I don't want to be in here any longer. And for some reason, we're popped out by the armorer. So that's a thing. But now we have the Bazaar District open to us, which means that we can actually go around and explore for the remainder of the video. It also means that we it's uh, pretty much a good time in order to get suited up for the road ahead. Because yeah, we can't get any upgrades until we liberate the appropriate districts. For the Bazaar, we're able to get our final pieces of armor for both characters. <laughs> oh. A crisis with this man and what he wants to do. But we need to use this for practical purposes. So let's get that Altadorian plate, which is really nice. It's a good contrast in color and really shows off that, yeah, he doesn't have a helmet piece anymore. Not since the noble ro noble plate. But yeah, the Altadorian plate is really good. And then finally for Roberta, not my favorite for her, but the Lebergen robes are pretty all right for her. She does say jumpsuit, and she's kind of right about that. Like especially in the the pants situation, it's like. Yep, there's 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 a there's a butt, there's there's all that stuff. There we go. It's got her jumpsuit, that's all good. The rest are outdoors. But wow. the characters weren't around and neither are really the items in order to buy. Huh? Hmm. Well, uh, thank you, I guess. One, you have a treasure maps, which are super good. For the clover, which is really just me burning Neo points because I don't think we can add any more clover to our meter. And potions that I won't be using. Okay, hey, cool. Now let's look at the other store. And especially with uh, dialogue here. Mm -hmm. There's a good amount of feuding happening between the two of them. Not across the street, not in some other curious... No, it's here. It's here. You have no reason to go over there. Even though I just saw you buy from them, why did you buy from them? God. But you know, he has another treasure map, which is always appreciated. We finally get some items from here, as well as the final shield for Tor. So, well, we could say goodbye to our golden set now. We gotta get our Altadorian set going with our final shield. It's got the emblem on it. It's really nice. Maybe it's just because it's circular and has good symmetry to it that I really like the design. It's really nice. Really good. I am super yellow, though. Get better light. That's a little bit better. Yeah. It's really nice. I like it. Pretty much what that leaves is just talking to the people around. Most of them have some interesting things to say. They'll talk about the heroes some sometimes, they'll talk about their own district, they'll talk about other districts. But the main person you want to talk about um, to is in the Bizarre District is Rogan here. Because again, there is going to be at least one person per act that has the ability to sell you maps. He doesn't have a whole lot of maps. What is happening with his face? I've never seen this kind of 
face with a character anymore. His lip is just really stretched weird. Uh, can I see this a little bit better? Maybe I have to go into his face. Eh, uh, not really. That doesn't really help. His, his mouth is just weird. Okay, there we go. You do have to talk to him a few times in order to make sure that his he st actually starts selling his maps. Sounds like a blueprint more than a map. They do go to other districts, so we're going to be just holding on to them for the time being. I'm going to hold on to pretty much all of the maps at this point until we have all of them, and then we can do with just a widespread clear of Altador of all the treasure. But yeah, he does run out of maps pretty soon. He only has the two really to sell. The Bizarre District is definitely the most shady out of the four. Well, I hope so. There we go. We need a smile. Hey, super happy. <laughs> oh, this never gets old. I like it. I, I like it too much. Maybe because it's been taken over by purple. Screw you then. Yeah. Talk to this guy named Timon. Is this supposed to be a joke? I'm not sure. Uh, he's talking about steaming bloops, and I'm, <laughs> I'm not comfortable either. Well, well, we'll figure that out at one point, because we're down one district, but we have plenty more to do. We're pretty much going to be going in a counterclockwise kind of rotation in order to get the districts done. So next time, we're going to be going on to the next district and helping out the next hero in need. See you next time, everyone.